In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Here we are at noon on Good Friday. As scripture tells us, this is the sixth hour as our Savior was hanging upon the cross. This is probably going to be the loneliest Good Friday that I've ever spent in my ministry. And used to having at least a good handful of people to join me as we go through these meditations, but I offer them here for you today in order for you to be able to reflect being here at the foot of the cross. These meditations will, I'll do an introduction first, and then at 1230, starting every 20 minutes, I will have another one in case you need to get up and move around. But I want you to consider here that here we are, we're looking at the cross, perhaps standing around, sitting around, gazing upon it. But it's important to remember that all of this began in a garden. It's because the battle came to a head in a garden. It was there that Jesus made the final decision to die for us. It was in the garden that our redemption was decided. It was on the cross that it was accomplished. From the moment Jesus decided to go forward and die, he surrendered himself into the hands of his enemies. From then on, he was bound to die, unless he denied everything for which he had lived. From the moment he delivered himself into the hand of his enemies, even if he said nothing, he would die. And the moment of decision was in the garden. We often think, as we should, about the suffering of Christ upon the cross, but before we turn to the cross itself, I want to draw your attention to many other sufferings of Christ along the way from the garden to Calvary. It was Satan's hour. Jesus Jesus himself described it that way. And the Prince of Darkness made sure that every step of the way that Christ had chosen should be painful. First, there was the betrayal. Jesus had known from the beginning who it was who would betray him. But even so, now that the moment had come, how much it must have hurt. How often had Judas been in that garden with Jesus? He knew how precious it was to our Lord because he was able to step away there from the pressures that he was always under when he was in Jerusalem and he would step into the tranquility of that garden. How much of the teaching handed down to us in scripture was first given to the disciples in that garden. When Judas left the Last Supper, he knew that Jesus would make for Gethsemane that night. It was not even a clean, decent betrayal, with Judas standing there with the soldiers pointing and saying, there's your man. Jesus was presumably expecting that. But no, Judas comes and kisses him as though he was his greatest friend. I wonder if for a moment Jesus was tempted to turn away, a spontaneous kind of reaction, as Judas stepped forward to embrace him. How much that kiss must have hurt. Something of that added pain escapes the lips of our Lord. He says, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And so the soldiers come forward 
and take him. He doesn't offer any resistance. In fact, he calmly addresses them. He says, whom do you seek? And they reply, Jesus of Nazareth. And he simply says, I am he. They had swords and clubs, obviously expecting a fight. When Jesus simply says, I am he, they were just nonplussed. I mean, he was the one that was in charge of the situation, not they. Perhaps had nothing else happened, he would have had to lead them to the high priest's house, but as it were, Peter rushes in, just like we figured he would, without thinking, drawing his sword out and cutting off the ear of Malchus, the high priest's slave. Although Jesus heals it right away and tells Peter to put the sword away, the damage was done. Resistance had been offered, so the spell of Christ's calm authority in that garden was broken. The soldiers bind him up and take him off as a common captive. Judas had betrayed Jesus, and now Peter failed him. Maybe his motive was love, but the consequence was that Jesus was taken from his disciples with the last action they had performed, showing that they had completely misunderstood all of his teaching over the three years about the nature of his kingdom. Christ's overwhelming personal authority had been totally undermined by Peter's violence. It's true that the Holy Spirit would teach them the truth, but that was to come in the future. Jesus was led away at the moment when he saw that he had failed to get his teaching over to the few men on whom everything depended, and knowing that he would have no further chance to be with them to set things aright. He was taken into captivity knowing he failed. And then having discovered a few minutes earlier that while he'd been battling out the decision to die, his disciples had been asleep when he thought they were praying for him. Now as the soldiers lead him away, the disciples abandon him and they run for their lives. It's easy enough for us to say that Jesus knew the scripture that the shepherd would be smitten and the flock scattered. But it's one thing to read scripture in the quiet hills overlooking the Sea of Galilee and quite another experience to see its fulfillment in the hostility of Jerusalem. As Jesus was taken from the garden, there was on his face the sensation of the kiss of Judas in his mind, the knowledge that his disciples had totally failed to grasp his teaching about the kingdom. And before his eyes, the sight of his closest friends running away to put the greatest possible distance between them and him. That's just the beginning of the road to the cross. So he was first taken to Annas and then to Caiaphas. And of course, they searched for evidence to convict him. But for what? For caring? For loving? For healing? I mean, there was just nothing there on which they could hope to gain a conviction on. And then one fellow steps up to testify, falsely of course, did Jesus think it is for you and others like you that I am standing here? Another one also gave false evidence, but that was kind of awkward because the two of them contradicted themselves. And so they asked him, the accused person, to condemn himself. Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. That was enough. Have you realized that Jesus was condemned not only for telling the truth, but being the truth? A murderer may confess his crime and he may tell the truth and be condemned because he has admitted that he is evil. Jesus told the truth and was condemned because he admitted he was good. And so they take the king of all creation, blindfold him, 
and take it in turns to hitting him, saying, go on, prophesy, which of us struck you? As though they're playing the children's game of blind man's bluff. But winning eternal life for you and for me was not a child's play for Christ. At some point during that long night, and as dawn was breaking, Peter, who had crept back to see what was happening, denied twice that he knew Christ. And then as he denied it the third time, Jesus knew. I mean, we often think of Peter's feelings as we read the words, and the Lord turned and looked on Peter. But what about Christ's feelings? How evil of Satan to make that last bitter twist of the knife in the wound. There was pain enough for Peter to remember the Lord's prophecy that he would deny him three times before the cock crew twice. There was no need for the Lord to be reminded of it on top of all the other torment that he had to bear. As the cock crew and the Lord turned to look at Peter, and Peter's heart smote him as he realized what he had done, Think of our Lord in his human nature, looking at Peter and realizing he has just said for the third time tonight that he does not know me at all. In that moment, did there flash into his mind the memory of the day that Andrew first introduced Peter to him? This is my brother, Simon. Or the scene by the sea where Peter made that great and miraculous catch and had knelt and said, Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. Or the moment when Peter had seen the truth at Caesarea Philippi. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. On the mountain when Peter had wanted to set up three tents and dwell there forever with his Lord. As Jesus was led off to Pilate, it was the knowledge that Peter his Peter, the Simon he had turned into Peter, had just sworn solemnly, I do not know the man. Now, don't want to get down into a false sentimentalism or emotionalism, but notice the refinement of the torture. It's not simply that Jesus suffered incredible physical pain as he died on the cross. Satan ensured that Christ was going to drain the cup of bitterness to its very dregs. Not only was Christ to die for the world as an outcast, with the world not understanding, he went to, cross, to the cross knowing he was a failure. Of the whole of his ministry, not one thing was standing. He couldn't point to one thing that he had done in his life where he had succeeded and the success would stand. It's true that he had healed people. Perhaps the greatest miracle of all was the raising of Lazarus, who had been dead for three days. But that was only temporary, because we know Lazarus was going to die again. Everyone will die eventually. As Jesus went to the cross, there wasn't anything he could point to and say, well, at least that will survive. At the end, he was left only with the twelve. One of those betrayed him. The rest had not understood what his teaching was all about, and they all ran off and left him. And finally, the one he had chosen as the rock upon whom he would build his church just said, I swear I do not know the man. Of course, we know the end of the story. We know about Easter Sunday and Pentecost. But... Do not lessen, let that lessen your understanding of Good Friday. It was the human Jesus, the man Jesus, albeit he could never cease to be who he was in his essence, God of God, very God of very God, who went through Thursday night and Friday morning to the human Jesus where it was Sunday. This was Friday. He was tired. He was alone, and he was a failure. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain, and entered not into glory before he was crucified. 
Merciful grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace. Through the same thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus spoke seven times from the cross. We're here now spending really the last three hours in meditation. Had we arrived at Calvary at this time for the last three hours of our Lord's agony, we would have missed the first three of his exclamations. Remember, our Savior actually hung on the cross for six hours. And his first exclamation came as the nails were being hammered into his hands. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As we begin to attempt to understand the significance of this, we really must stand back in astonishment. There is the immediate human understanding and certainly that is wonder enough. Here's a man concerned more for the people that are causing him agony than for himself, who is actually suffering the agony. And it happens at the very moment that that agony is being caused. I mean, that in and of itself is astonishing. But think about this. This is the creator the one who gave life to his torturers, having his own life taken away by those he had created. Man has reached now the final stage of his rebellion. Having rejected his creator, he now kills him. Do not miss the wonder by saying, oh, well, Jesus could forgive because he was God. The whole point is that he who was and who could never cease to be God became man. And as man forgave his fellow men who caused him pain. Moreover, not only did he forgive them, he was pleading with his father to forgive them too. Now, let's hold that for a moment while we put another issue out. In his description of the crucifixion, St. Matthew tells us that after they had fastened Christ to the cross and divided his clothes among them by throwing dice, the soldiers sat down and kept watch over him. It was not that the crucified man could possibly release himself, but maybe some friend or sympathizer might actually try to do so. But the great majority of the crowd had come for the spectacle. It was entertainment. It was the eve of a great festival, Passover. It was holiday time, just like it is for us today. It's Good Friday. We're moving into the Easter holiday. The religious festivities were going to begin for the people that evening, but meanwhile, perhaps Moishe's there talking to Moira, why don't we just stroll on over to Calvary? I hear they're crucifying three men today. So here the soldiers were. They sat and they watched him there. What a lesson can be drawn for those two words. Him there. I'm not for one moment suggesting that you are keeping watch with me today to be entertained. But what have you come for is to remind your is it to remind yourself of what happened that first good friday to think more specifically of christ's passion great but let me encourage you to watch him there but think of yourself 
As you hear him say of those who caused him pain, Father, forgive them. What's your attitude to those who cause you pain? Is there someone you do not forgive? Some member of the family you do not speak to, or at least you're not more than reasonably polite. Perhaps there was a dispute about a will. Happens all the time, I've seen it. They've had more than their fair share, or maybe they think you did. Or someone looked after an elderly relative and others think it was to get their hands on their property their money. Or a friend or a neighbor perhaps once said or did something that upset you, and so you just cut yourself off from them. Oh, but that's different, you may say. In my case, that person really meant to hurt me. Seriously? What about those who drove the nails into Jesus? Do you think that they were hoping, oh, shucks, this ain't gonna hurt? Jesus says, Father, these people who are in the very act of causing me excruciating pain, please forgive them, won't you? Are you planning on receiving Holy Communion on Easter Sunday morning? Most of you won't be able to be here, but you can make your spiritual communion at home. If, as I've been speaking, the Holy Spirit has reminded you of someone with whom you are out of fellowship, someone you have not forgiven, what will you do between now and then? There's time to make a phone call. You could pop them off an email this afternoon, message them on Facebook, send them a text, whatever. Yeah, you know what? It, maybe it was their fault, and you were actually in the right. But so was Jesus on the cross. He was utterly right, and those who put him there were utterly wrong. But Jesus took it. He absorbed it. He transformed the wrong and the evil and gave it back as love. Will you do all you can from your side to set right that which was caused the breakdown in the relationship so that you can, with a clear conscience, receive our Lord's body and blood on Easter Sunday morning? Or are you here today only to watch him there? One more thing before we leave these words. Those who nailed Jesus to the cross were guilty of a terrible sin, no doubt. They were crucifying their creator. What possible way could be found for them to be forgiven for such an act as that? Only the death of a redeemer in their place. By crucifying Christ, they were consigning themselves to eternal death. By allowing them to do it, he was offering them the opportunity of eternal life. I, I don't know how it can be that Jesus dying on a cross almost 2,000 years ago can cancel your sins today. But God says it is so. And in the wonder of eternity, I accept that. I accept that grace. Now, I'm not going to imply that every sin you commit now added to the pain that Christ suffered back then. I don't think that kind of a remark would be particularly helpful, and I don't think that it really works like that. Nevertheless, as you sit there at home and watch him there, you see what sin does to God. My friends, Christ still suffers. Scripture shows that for when Saul, who would later become Paul, persecuted the church, Jesus asked him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? That clever,
cutting remark you made, the way you spoke to that guy in the warehouse, or the cashier at Ingalls, one of my favorite people, your husband, your wife, your father, your mother, your daughter, your son, the sharp tongue, the selfish act, you are doing it to Christ because you are doing it to someone he made, someone he loves. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, because if they did, they would not do it, would they? Let us pray. O Lord our God, open our hearts, we pray thee, to the inflowing of thy forgiving love. Break down, we beseech thee, the barriers of self-satisfaction that separate us from sharing in thy all-conquering life. Enable us in the power of thy self-giving to live generously, ready to forgive others even as thou hast forgiven us for the sake of him who died upon the cross that we might live, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The second time that Jesus spoke from the cross was to the thief. Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. I mean, there's so much to be learned from this particular incident. I mean, where do we even begin? But think of the humility of Jesus, that wonderful free will offering of his life, I mean, it was not some tremendous, spectacular act. It was simply one of three executions carried out that day. There had been others before, and there would be more in the future. It's like reading the lists of men and women sent to the gas chamber in a concentration camp, and suddenly you come upon the name Jesus of Nazareth. Make no mistake about the two thieves on either side of Jesus. They were evil, rotten men. Even the Romans did not lightly sentence men to that sort of death, to crucifixion. To think of some particularly evil criminal of today, the sort that would assault some frail and er elderly woman in her home, steal a dollar or two from her handbag and leave her dying on the floor or a man that abducts some happy little schoolgirl on her way home to her birthday party, abuses her, and leaves her body in the dumpster. That was the kind of guys, murderers, robbers, that were crucified on either side of Christ. At first, so scripture tells us, they both reviled Jesus. In passing, think how that must have added to Christ's loneliness and his pain. You would have thought that their common fate and their agony would have united these two with him. But no, they're against him too. In that awful pain, one of the thieves turns to Christ. He says, aren't you supposed to be the Messiah? and save yourself and us. Notice at that point, Christ makes no answer. If someone says something hurtful or unkind to you, are you not usually provoked into answering back? But he said nothing. You see, that's the irony of the situation. Because Jesus was the Messiah, is the Messiah and the Son of God, he could have come down from that cross. He made that plain in the garden when he told Peter to put away his sword. 
told him, I have only to ask my Father in heaven and he will send his angels to save me. Jesus, the Messiah, could have asked his Father to save him. But because he was the Messiah, he must not ask that. For if he saved himself, he could save no one else. But if he did not save himself, he would be able to offer salvation to everyone else. There's an old saying that most men die as they have lived. I cannot tell if that's particularly true or not. Certainly it seems to be true of that first thief and of Jesus. The thief died swearing, complaining, trying to force others to do as he demanded. Christ also died as he lived, thinking of others and putting them before himself. However, with that other thief, something astonishing happened. Have you ever considered how astonishing it actually was? I mean, if this man had been among the crowd when Jesus had healed a paralyzed person or a blind man, we might have expected him to at least respect Christ. You know, possibly not recognize him as the Messiah. A lot of people didn't. But what was it that enabled him as he was trying to cope with his own agony, half blinded by pain, to look across at another broken body hanging in the similar anguish and recognize that this was the eternal king of all creation? Perhaps for the very first time in his life, he was willing to admit to the person he was. I mean, he said to the other one, he says, we're getting what we deserve for what we did. He passed judgment on himself. He was saying, in effect, I have failed to live up to what even I know I should be, let alone what God requires. Let's think about this for a minute. I don't want anybody to have any doubt about this. What are you trusting for in your salvation? Are there any of you out there that think that you've lived a reasonably good life and so God is going to accept you? I sure hope not. Because if you do, you have misunderstood the gospel. Do you think that God will, as it were, weigh out your evil deeds and your good deeds? And if your good ones smash the scale down and outweigh the bad ones, you're going to gain heaven? And, but if the bad crashes down and outweighs the good, you're going to hell? does not work that way. If anyone believes that, they don't understand what Christ was doing on the cross. Also can't understand, really, how he could accept that thief. If the child abuser, the serial killer, or the multiple rapist ever gets to the place of that thief alongside Jesus on the cross, if he is overwhelmed by his sin, repents, and begs Jesus to have mercy, forgive, and receive him, he too will have eternal life. And if you have never got to that place and made the same plea, but rather you are trusting in what you believe to be your own reasonably righteous life, you will not. That's why Jesus said that the harlots and those dishonest tax collectors we're getting into heaven against the self-righteous Pharisees. You cannot earn your own way into heaven. No one has ever done that. You must tread the same path, the exact same path as this thief. He said, I deserve death. 
remember me, Lord. Notice he really didn't plea anything. There was no reason he could find in his life why Jesus should accept him. His only hope was that Jesus might find it in his heart to have him. The insults of the one thief could bring no word from the lips of Jesus. The cry from help from the other one did. Somehow he had recognized Jesus as king as king and made him his king. And Jesus accepted that. Accepted that thief's submission. I mean, the cross made a very strange throne for Jesus and a strange cradle for the newborn thief. But that's what it was. Jesus accepted the thief's worship and gave him eternal life. Not for some time in the future, but then. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, for who for our sakes didst take upon thee our nature, and dost know in thine own person our human need and aspirations, enable us, we beseech thee in the power of thy love, to see thee in the lives of those around us, and be ever ready to minister to their need, as thou shalt grant us opportunity. We ask in thy name, who with the Father and the Holy Ghost livest and reignest ever, one God, world without end. Amen. Jesus spoke again, this time to Mary. Woman, behold thy son. The relationship between Jesus and Mary, his mother, is interesting. I mean, of course, we know when he was young, he would have depended upon her for all his needs, just like any other baby. And probably, as with all Jewish households, it would have been his mother who had taught him the scriptures. And from her, he would have learned of the promised coming of the Messiah. However, although she was his mother, she needed a savior as much as anyone else. I mean, scripture does not teach that Mary's own conception was immaculate. She was not sinless. So the relationship of mother and son was also one of sinner and savior. Perhaps one of the burdens that Jesus had to bear was that his mother didn't understand his mission. On one occasion, she tried to stop him from preaching. You'll remember that she had said at that time, he is beside himself. And we today would say, he's out of his mind. The crowd that had gathered around Jesus in a house, he was told, your mother and your brothers are outside calling for you. And he asked the question, who is my mother? And who are my brothers? And then went on to explain that he regarded as his true brothers all who did the will of his heavenly father. I mean, it's understandable that Mary should be concerned and try to stop his preaching because it was going to get him into trouble. Yeah. But it shows that she really did not fully comprehend what he had come to do. Imagine how much that must have hurt Jesus because he reminded her, as we know, that he had to be about his father's business. 
Maybe the rest of the world did not understand. But to find your own mother doesn't understand either and is seeking to stop you. Those of you who are parents, have you actually released your children to the Lord? They're not yours, you know. They have been lent to you for a little while. You, as stewards, are to care for them on God's behalf. Because finally, they are His, not yours. I mean, how many young men and women have heard the call of God down through the ages to some kind of service, perhaps in a foreign land, and the mother or father has said, you know, undoubtedly, with loving motives, said to them, why? <laughs> you wasted all that four years of college, your education, and you're just going to go off to Africa and dig wells? You're going to go to India and teach in a Dalit school? Or maybe go, maybe go down to Ecuador and go up and live with the Quechua people? and help them build their buildings? Or maybe you'll go off to Washington Heights to New York City. I don't know. I mean, if that child knows that it is indeed the call of Christ, then he or she must obey and leave the parent. But how much more difficult how much greater the burden if they have to go knowing that someone they love just does not understand and imagines and that person the parent imagines that it's a slight that you would actually even consider leaving them maybe some similar thought went through the mind of Jesus as he hung there you know, it's as though, really, what he does here is he forgets himself utterly. He looks down, he sees a mother, his mother, suffering because she sees that her son is in pain and there is nothing she can do to help him. I mean, how many mothers have sat by a hospital bed waiting, watching for her child to regain consciousness after some accident or some illness? unable to do a thing and that makes it worse I mean but this scene here is even more painful for she has to make her son fully conscious suffer torture and die by stages more there's the shame as other people are mocking and taunting him dying as a criminal between two other dirtbags. What must that do to a mother's heart? So Christ looks down, sees his mother suffering because her son has been crucified. And his heart goes out to her in such compassion that it's as though it's incidental that he is the son that the mother is watching that it is his pain, his tortured body, that's involved in this whole matter. Who's going to care for her? Who's going to ensure that she's provided for? I mean, widows had a really tough time of it back in those days. Way tougher than in ours. But he sees there, he sees his friend, the beloved disciple, John. And with what lovely words he commits his mother to his care. He says, woman, behold your son. And then to John, behold your mother. For us, maybe we might expect a plea like, John, please take care of mama for me. But this is more than that. 
It's mother, you have a new son, son, John, you now have a new mother. And the record states that from that very hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Again now, Christ falls silent. There's nothing more that he can do for anyone. He has asked forgiveness for his torturers. He has assured the thief of a place in his eternal kingdom. And finally now he has provided for his mother. Now he must use all of his remaining strength in yielding himself deliberately to die as a free will offering for your sin and mine. Let us pray. O Lord Jesus Christ, who on thy cross didst take loving thought for thy mother and thy friend, grant us grace to be always tender and thoughtful in our relations with those who are near and dear to us. Give us, we beseech thee, in our home and friendships, powers of understanding and sympathy, that through us there may be shed abroad something of thine own divinely human love. We ask in thy name, who with the Father and the Holy Ghost, livest and reignest ever, one God, world without end. Amen. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's the fourth statement spoken by Jesus from the cross, the fourth of the seven, the one smack dab in the middle. And it's also the very heart of the atonement we really have so little realization of the horror of sin. Let's face it, we're used to it. The farmhand who spent all day in the pigsty is unaware of the smell that accompanies him and others recoil away. We are so used to living in a sinful world that we forget that God is of purer eyes than to look upon iniquity. In the Old Testament, there is a full description of the tabernacle. Probably, if you have read the description at all, you have found the detailed measurements dry and meaningless. However, if you take the trouble to work them out, you'll discover some interesting truths. It was there in the tabernacle that God had promised to dwell with his people. As they pitched their tents, there in the middle of the camp was God's tent too. It was there in their midst, but it was surrounded by a tall fence, so tall that no one could see over it. However, the tabernacle itself was higher still, so the top of it could be seen rising above the height of the fence. I mean, what a great visual aid that is. God was saying, here I am. You can't approach me. Your sin is still a barrier between us. But there was in the fence just one entrance at the far end of the compound from the tabernacle tent. Those who wanted to draw near to God had come through that one doorway. As they did so, ahead of them, but at the far end, was the tent where God had promised to meet with them. But between them and the tent, directly 
in their line of sight and almost hiding the tent from view was a giant altar. Before then they could reach the tent where God dwelt, they had to bring a sacrifice. There were various types of offerings for different purposes. One required a lamb. The person making the offering would bring his lamb, lay his hands upon it, confess his sins over it, and in that way he proclaimed in symbolism, I am transferring my sin to the lamb. This lamb is representing me. It's taking my place. And then he took a knife out and killed the lamb. After which, the priest then would take the blood and throw it all over the altar. However, even after that, the man himself could not enter into the tent inside was divided up, couldn't enter into the holy place, nor the most holy place, what's called the holiest of holies. He needed a priest to enter in on his behalf. Indeed, regarding the holiest of holies, it was only the high priest who could enter there, and that on only one day a year, the Day of Atonement, when he would make atonement for the sins of all the people, including himself. And between the holy place and the most holy place, there was a curtain. Again, clear visual teaching. God saying, I am here in your midst, but you cannot approach me because of your sin. Like the curtain, your sin bars the way into my presence. I mean, there's really no time here to be able to examine in full the rich symbolism of all of it. But let's touch on a couple of obvious aspects. There was only one gate or door in the fence into the place where God dwelt. Jesus said, I am the door. He also said, I am the way. No one comes to the Father but by me. The sinner brought a lamb as a sacrifice. John the Baptist said of Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Only the high priest could enter the holiest of holies, the place where God dwelt. Jesus is the great high priest who takes with him not the blood of bulls or goats or sheep, but his own blood. And there is one more dramatic event that we should consider. And for this, we have to jump ahead to the moment that Christ died. There was an earthquake, and the curtain of the temple was rent in twain, as the scripture says. Now, the temple in Jerusalem was modeled exactly upon the tabernacle, except it wasn't a tent, but of course it was a permanent building and it was twice the size of the tabernacle. Still, a curtain hung between the holy place and the most holy place, the holiest of holies, in the temple. As Christ died, that curtain was torn in two. What clearer message could God give that the way to his presence was now open for all to enter in. The barrier of sin had been destroyed. Remember that this teaching and symbolism of the tabernacle was given to Moses hundreds of years before Christ fulfilled its teaching so exactly. And then there's people out there saying that the Bible is just nothing more than just some made up thing. If you hear this teaching, I picture a man seeking to enter the tabernacle compound to meet with God, and the first thing he sees barring his way is the great altar stained with so much blood from so many animals, perhaps he'd ask the question, what sort of God is this that delights in so much blood? I would suggest that God ans asks a different question. What is man that it costs so much to redeem him. You know, sometimes we men wear little lapel badges. You know, we wear some little church symbols or maybe a cross. And then ladies, 
y'all perhaps, with your husband tagging along with the credit card, go into a jeweler to find just the perfect, prettiest little cross to dangle right about your neckline. Now, I'm not going to say that we ought not wear such things, but let's be aware of what we're doing. The cross is neither neat, fashionable, nor pretty. It is an instrument of torture, a bloody thing, the gallows upon which men died. All right, with that background, let's go back. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I said earlier today that Christ went to the cross a failure, that nothing that he had done in his life survived. The people that he had healed would die one day, as would Jairus' daughter, the widow of Nain's son, and of course Lazarus. All three had been raised from death once. His mother didn't understand him. One of the disciples betrayed him. At the time he needed them most, they had all run off and left him. And the one on whom he had planned to build his church had denied him three times that he had ever known him. But Jesus had one overriding comfort. He knew he was perfectly fulfilling his father's will. His father approved of what he was doing. Always, in eternity, Jesus had an unbroken relationship with his father. From the sixth to the ninth hour, there was darkness. Despite some of the rather, shall we say, unwise translations of some modern versions of the Bible, it could not possibly have been a natural eclipse of the sun. The date of Passover was fixed according to the position of the moon, and an eclipse when it was in that position would be impossible. Somehow, and here we enter into a mystery, the sin of all the world for all time was laid on the Lamb of God. It was so intense that it spilled over from the spiritual, the supernatural realm into the natural. And the barrier of darkness actually hovered over the whole land centered upon the figure on the middle cross of the three that we see. As the darkness intensified, Christ found to his horror that whereas until then, with the barriers set up by mankind's sin between man and God, he'd always been on the same side as the Father. Now, he was on the other side. The one comfort he had in the midst of all the opposition, all the hurt and the failure, the one comfort of knowing that he was fulfilling his father's will was taken away. Even his father rejected him. Now, it's true that in fact Christ has never pleased his father more than in that moment. But because in that moment he was made sin for us, the father who cannot even look at sin, had to cut himself off from his son, who then experienced the most horrifying loneliness and desolation of all time. The frightening cry was wrung from him, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the answer is this, God could save either Jesus or you. He chose you. Let us pray. O God, who in the mystery of thy love did suffer thy dear Son to feel forsaken of thee, grant us in all our doubts the remembrance of thy goodness, the awareness of thy glory, though we cannot behold it in the darkness, the loving acceptance of the duty immediately at hand, though we cannot see beyond it. And so bring us at last to the clear vision of thyself, through the same thy Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
I thirst. There's one thing we need to understand clearly. The middle statement from the cross, when Christ felt himself cut off from God, that was the crisis point. Yes, Jesus still had to die. No question about it. It was inevitable. The death blow had been struck. But in that awful cry of desolation, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus was cut off from his father by your sin and mine. It was not a question of how long that separation lasted. You know, a scientist will tell you that static electricity passes through a wire in an instant if that wire makes contact with the ground. It was the act of separation, the putting away of sin that was important. And that cry from the son to his father, it happened. And from then on, the crisis was over. As we shall see, from that moment, the relationship was restored, and Jesus knew it. This is borne out by the words of Scripture, that Jesus, knowing that all things were finished or accomplished, said, I thirst. Only now, after pleading for his torturers, Father, forgive them, they do not know what they're doing, assuring the thief that he would be with him in paradise, ensuring that his mother would be cared for, and having borne the weight of the sin of mankind with the horror of separation from his father, which that inevitably entailed. Only then did Christ think of himself. He was thirsty, undoubtedly so. I mean, hunger can cause people to faint, and so there's a certain dulling of the senses, if you will, but that's not the way it is with thirst. People have been driven almost mad by the lack of water. In addition to all the pain caused, and deliberately planned to be caused by crucifixion, Jesus was now thirsty. It's ironic to recall that not so many weeks before that he had cried out in that very city, if any one is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. I wonder how many of the priests that were passing by back then remembered that and mocked him all the more as he hung on the cross. I suppose it is in the words, I thirst, that we most see clearly Christ's full identification with us, with mankind. I have not yet found any experience which we have to go through that Christ did not experience in some form or other. Hunger, thirst, exhaustion, physical pain, abuse, misunderstanding, rejection, fear, and of course, finally, death itself. But there is another thought also. Our God was so totally self-giving that he was dependent upon mankind for his needs. He was nailed to the cross. Not only could he not go get a drink for himself, but even if one was brought to him, he couldn't raise it to his lips. If no one responded to that cry, I thirst, then he remained suffering. How many people are there in the world today? People created in the image of God, as we are, who are crying out, I am hungry, I am thirsty. And in our particular time right now, in this COVID crisis that we're in, the numbers are ramping up very quickly. But what about those people out there? Like their creator on the cross, they're helpless. 
unless someone responds to their cry. What are you doing about that? Remember, for as much as you do to the least of these, in the name of Christ, you do it to him. He is that deeply involved. It is little use of our having this time of devotion if our devotion to our Lord does not result in action toward those he loves, whose cry, I th hunger, I thirst, causes him still to suffer today. At the cross, we know the story, someone ran and brought some of the sour wine that gets rationed out to the Roman soldiers and had the wherewithal to put it on a sponge, which he put on the end of a spear or a stick and raised it up to Christ's lips. Yet there were some who, while witnessing his agony, said, wait and see if God will save him. Some do that, or virtually do so, today. They see the want the deprivation, and the slow death, slower even than death on the cross, amongst great numbers of people in the world. And they pray and wait to see whether God is going to save them. Can we not see that God still puts himself into the hands of mankind? And if mankind does not respond, God is helpless? God does not mint money. The only money that God has is in the pockets, the purses, the bank accounts of his people, his body on earth. Now, I, I speak to myself just like to you. I mean, what am I really doing to help those crying, I thirst, today in my lifetime? Little enough. But we have the opportunities. The opportunities are always given to us to be able to support, to support those in need, our local food banks, our local Christian help organizations, ones that we support all the time with our outreach funds, and also our outreach donations, foodstuffs, things like that. Perhaps, just perhaps, maybe we, as Christian people here at All Saints, could add a little extra to our outreach funds. I leave that up to you. Will you do so? And remember, it's always easy to intend to do so and let it fall by the wayside for lack of definite action. And then it'll be another year before you hear again the cry of the poor peoples from the cross of Christ. I have no hands on earth but yours for mine, which were nailed helpless to the cross, now plead for you and for them in heaven. Listen, do you hear? And then still, I thirst. Let us pray. O Lord Jesus Christ, who in thy passion has sounded the depths of human anguish, grant we beseech thee that in all we are called upon to bear of pain, physical or mental, we may be drawn into the fellowship of thy sufferings, so into deeper sympathy with the pain and grief of others, and into a new sense of union with thy redeeming love. We ask in thy name, who with the Father and the Holy Ghost liveth and reigneth ever, one God, world without end. Amen.
it is finished. We require three words to convey what Christ said in one. It was a glorious shout. Done. Completed. Finished. But let's be quite clear that this does not mean I am finished or I am done for or I finally had it. No, this is a shout of victory. I have done it. There are not many who die feeling that they have accomplished everything they have wanted to do. Schubert left a symphony behind that is actually known as the unfinished. Charles Dickens left behind an uncompleted novel. And anyone who has had the sad task of tidying up the affairs of a loved one who has died will know how much has been hoarded just in case they might need it again. Some have died rather suddenly with knitting or sewing, embroidery, whatever, half finished. Or there's a book they've been reading, but only gotten halfway through. We die incomplete, so to speak. But that was not so with Christ. There were no personal effects to deal with. He owned nothing except the clothes he stood up in, and the soldiers who had crucified him had those because they were, that was the perks of the job. But as for his work, that was completed. Now let's think about just what that work was. There must have been some moment in heaven before the creation of the world when the Godhead agreed to create the universe and then the very crown of their creation, mankind. Let us make man in our own image. I mean, we have to take care here because with our human limitations, we do not really know what we're talking about when we speak of heaven. However, in that decision to create man, to love him into being, God must have foreseen his rebellion and fall, but also decided upon a way to win his redemption. Somehow the son must have offered to leave his father's side in glory and to become man, part of his own creation. And also fully appreciating the cost involved, he offered himself to his father to die for the sins of the world. We know that because Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, we read that the lamb, slain, the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. So Christ was born to die. That's not to say that because all human beings die by taking our human nature upon himself, that Christ would also be subject to death. No, he received human life in order to be able to offer that life as a sacrifice. He was born to die. When he became flesh, he would have no memory of that decision in heaven. Many people have never really thought that through. The little baby in the manger was not lying there thinking, oh, of course I'm God. Although Jesus was, in his essential being, part of the Godhead and could never cease to be God, he really did become fully man. He had a human body with a human brain. As he grew older, he would have been taught about God's promise that a Messiah would come, and gradually it would have dawned on him that he was that expected Messiah. He would then have had to learn exactly what that meant. Having in heaven come to the decision that he would offer himself as a ransom for many, he now had to make that same decision again, this time as a man upon earth. Let me put it another way. In heaven, Christ would have been involved in expressing 
the prophecy that the servant of the Lord would come on earth to be despised and rejected and finally killed. On earth, as a child growing to manhood, he would have heard that same prophecy and gradually have come to understand that it referred to himself. He learned all he could from the law and the prophets. We know that he got left behind in Jerusalem when he was 12, talking with the doctors in the temple. He was learning all he could. He was 30 before he actually took up his ministry and was baptized by John in the Jordan. At once, he went out into the wilderness to plan his ministry. He was immediately tempted by the devil, who did all he could to deflect him from the cross. Satan even offered to give Jesus the kingdoms of the world, the very kingdoms that Jesus had come to win, if only he would worship him instead of God the Father. Make no mistake about this. Jesus was tempted, sorely tempted, to go that way, to receive the world without the suffering of the cross. Never believe that Jesus found it easy to reject that much more attractive way. And then there was the time at Caesarea Philippi when Jesus asked the disciples if they knew who he was. It was Peter who saw it and said, why, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Immediately, immediately Jesus began to teach them what this meant, the cross. Peter said, no, Lord, not if you're the Messiah. You'll remember that this remark of Peter's was so attractive to Jesus, the possibility of avoiding the cross, that he recognized the same temptation and the same tempter behind Peter's words, and he cried out, Get thee behind me, Satan. Then, on that last journey up to Jerusalem from Galilee, you might remember the description how Jesus was behaving strangely unlike his usual self, that his disciples were disturbed. Jesus had set his face so determinedly toward Jerusalem and was so preoccupied that instead of walking with them, he kept striding on ahead, not realizing that he was doing so. Do not imagine that in his earthly ministry, Jesus was so spiritual, so otherworldly, that he had no problem in obeying God's will for him. This was the man, Christ Jesus, having to force himself to go to Jerusalem and face his betrayal, torture, and death. And <laughs> maybe he hardly even trusted himself not to back out. But we know about the battle in the garden, don't we? We began our time today in that garden. If Christ had been tempted by Satan before, now the strain is worse than ever. When he was in the wilderness, the cross lay three years down the road. Now it's tomorrow, tonight. At this moment, Judas is on his way with the soldiers. Father, is there some way for me to avoid going through this, he asks. The agony was so great that he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became as blood pouring down to the ground. What intensity of feeling must have been involved for that to happen? When he rose from prayer, he returned to the disciples and found them sleeping, and he said to them, Rise and pray that you enter not into temptation. It's not dishonoring Christ to believe what Scripture teaches us, that he was tempted to the breaking point not to go through with winning your salvation. He barely nearly cracked, so great was the strain. So no wonder, just before he died, he gave that great triumphant roar, I've done it, I've done it, it is finished, it is finished forever. The door stands open, and no one can shut it. And you have only to walk through it. 
Let us pray. Enable us, O Lord our God, to seek in all circumstances of daily living the doing of that which thou wouldest have us do, that we might come at last to thine unending joy, which thou dost promise to those who truly love thee. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. So now we have come to the closing moments of the earthly life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the most perfect human life that has ever been lived. Notice how completely he identified with us. Everything we have to face, somewhere Jesus faced something similar. Hunger, thirst, exhaustion, pain, being misunderstood, deserted, denied, betrayed. Finally, he died. Do you understand how astonishing that is? The God we worship, we who are Christians, our God knows what it feels like to die. I mean, just leave aside the reason why Christ came to die and what he accomplished in dying and think simply of the fact that we have a God who knows what it's like to die. In everything that happens to us in life, we can go to our God, our Christ, our Jesus and say, Lord, life isn't fair life hurts and he replies I know I really do know because it happened to me too in dying Christ revealed a deep basic principle of life the world demands I mean we're Americans after all right demands that we be strong competent successful Don't let others think you're weak. We have a God who is willing to die, helpless, hanging on a cross. What sort of God is that in the eyes of the world? He can't even save himself, so how can he possibly save anyone else? But that's it in his teaching of his disciples he explained to them a basic principle he who would save his life will lose it but he who loses his life for my sake will find it jesus lived out his teaching what does that say to us in our relationships in our homes How often have you held on to your rights as a matter of principle? Not giving way to your wife, your husband, or your children? Boss? Oh yeah, okay. You may have won the point, but did you win their respect? Have you won their love? Think about it. Which is more important? To win the day or to win their love? It was a strong thing to hang helpless on the cross to die. There's no weakness there. As the risen Christ was to teach St. Paul, my strength is made perfect in weakness. But that's foolishness to the world. It always was. It is right now, and it always will be. But you have to come out of the world to see it. So let's look at the actual words Christ used right there at the very end. 
the phrase itself, into thy hands I commend my spirit. No opening address, Father. It's found in Psalm 31, verse 5. Almost certainly our Lord would have heard those words as a baby. In the Jewish faith, there were certain scriptures to be taught to kids and others to be taught to the more mature. Psalm 31, verse 5, was one that would have been learned at a mother's knee. And it's most probable that Mary would have used these words every evening as she settled Jesus for the night. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. He would have been familiar with the sound of them, even before he understood what they meant, perhaps even before he knew they were words. It would have been much as Christian parents today settle their babies down with the words of the same song or prayer every single night. Remember the, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. It's very likely that the last words Jesus spoke on earth as a man were the first he learned as a baby. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. Certainly, they were natural to him and that the whole of his earthly life had been devoted to committing himself to his Father's will. It's no surprise, therefore, that now with the victory won, with that dreadful moment of separation and desolation over and the fellowship restored, Jesus should commit all that he was into the perfect and safest keeping of all which he had known throughout his entire life. He adds the word, Father. He knows intimately exactly who it is to whom he yields himself, Father. Now what about you? One day, you're going to die. In fact, you must die. Unless Christ comes again before that, it is the most certain fact of all your life. It will come to an end. Have you planned how you will die? I don't mean the cause of your death, an illness, accident, or just growing old. No, but as far as it lies within you, when the time of your death comes to you, have you decided how you plan to do it? You know, I, as a priest, I get called to the bedside of dying people, people that I don't know anything about. I have no idea whether they have any faith at all, and if they have, then in whom or in what? Perhaps they believe that there is a God, in much the same way as I believe that there's a Queen of England. I know Liz is there. I believe she's there. I know there's such a person, but I don't know her. Those kind of people cannot utter the wonderful word, Father. Often I've sensed a fear, a reluctance to let go because they don't know the one to whom they go. I need to stress this. If you do not know God now, you are unlikely to get to know him as your senses dim close to the time of death. I would like to die with Christ's words on my lip. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Or perhaps the very similar words like St. Stephen said, the first martyr, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. I believe that <clears throat> Jesus chose when to die. No, oh, within limits, of course. I mean, he was being put to death by men. But the actual moment, I believe, was Christ's decision. I hope that when I die, I'll be able to make mine a deliberate act of commending my spirit into the hands of the God who gave it to me. How about you? We have been here now for just shy of three hours. 
some of us are watching him there as we close. Let us remember that it was only because he was there on the cross for you, for me, that any of us has the right to say that word, Father, and continue without any fear. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Grant, we beseech the Almighty God, that like as we do believe thy only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to have ascended into the heavens, so we may also in heart and mind thither ascend and with him continually dwell, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests therefore and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him, and two other with him on either side one, and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam woven from the top throughout. They said therefore among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be. 
that the scripture might be fulfilled which saith, They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture did they cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, and his mother's wife Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalena. When Jesus therefore saw his mother, and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with the vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The, Jew, the Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came thereout blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Let us pray. Almighty God, with whom do live the spirits of them that depart hence in the Lord, and with whom the souls of the faithful after they are delivered from the burden of the flesh are in joy and felicity, we beseech thee that it may please thee of thy gracious goodness, shortly to accomplish the number of thine elect and to hasten thy kingdom, that we with all those that are departed in the true faith of thy holy name may have perfect consummation and bliss both in body and soul in thy eternal and everlasting glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. By thine agony and bloody sweat, by thy cross and passion, and by thy precious death and burial, good Lord, deliver us. Grant, we beseech thee, almighty God, that the words which we have heard this day with our outward ears may through thy grace be so grafted inwardly in our hearts that they may bring forth in us the fruit of good living to the honor and praise of thy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. <laughs> 